What's up, everybody? Remington here from Impulse Creative, and I've got a very special guest. I have Courtney Sembler from HubSpot Academy. She's an inbound professor, and she's here to tell us what we need to know about GDPR as agencies and as US-based businesses. How are you doing, Courtney? I'm well, how are you? Fantastic. So, you know, we've been getting a lot of questions going on about GDPR, whether it matters to, to us or whether it matters to our clients and, you know, how that changes things. But I figured I'd let you get started with telling us what GDPR is. And I know you've got a whole lesson plan that we'll share in the notes for this, but just kind of dig into, tell us what we need to know. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the GDPR is, well, it's coming. You know, May 25th, that is the deadline for compliance. Um, and it's much, uh, much closer than I think all of us would like. Um, but it's going to be here. It's going to kick off our sort of summer into the GDPR. And um, I know that we've all talked about the GDPR, whether, you know, we're B2B or B2C. It's something that we've heard about. Um, you know, whether you're an agency or maybe working with one, someone has mentioned the GDPR in the last probably a few months, if not multiple times. Um, but... I like to start off when I talk about it is just the GDPR means the general data protection regulation. Uh, that's definitely a mouthful. So I like that we've abbreviated it, yeah. um, but it's a new e-regulation and it's really going to be aimed at enhancing the protection of EU citizens, um, their personal data, increasing the obligations for us um, as people who are obtaining their data, processing their data, really making sure that, it's safe. And I think in our world today, as you know, so many other things have been happening, this is a good thing. It's a good thing that we're going to be focusing on data privacy, on having personal data be more protected. Uh, I definitely feel a little safer with the GDPR in place. Um, but what it means for a business, and particularly an agency, is that the way that you're going to be obtaining data and processing it is really going to change. It's really going to focus on that obligation that you have as an organization to be like, whose data am I collecting? Do I have really a legal basis? And we can talk about what that means, the lawful basis in a few moments, but you know, do I really have permission? Um, that gut check, do I have permission to do this? Have I asked for permission? And then what happens once they're in my database? I think one of the most important things with the GDPR is that once they're in the database, it doesn't quite just mean that they're there forever. It's, you now have to continue to think in a GDPR mindset moving forward. You know, how long should I keep it? Should I keep it there forever? You know, they even call out a new part of this law about the right to be forgotten as an individual. You know, you're not supposed to be in people's databases forever. Um, you know, keeping it there for the time being when you need it um, and then letting go if you don't need it anymore. Um, so some other high level things that we can think about with the GDPR is it does replace a former um, law. So the EU has definitely had some of these data regulations for a while. Um, so it's going to replace the 1995 law called the DPD. Um, there's more about that in the lesson. I won't get into it. If you're interested, check it out. Um, but it did have some of these obligations for an organization, but it wasn't as specific. So it didn't really get into that nitty gritty. Um, that's what the GDPR does. It really gets focused on the people's privacy and what us as organizations um, need to do about it. So that's just kind of a high level overview of what the GDPR is um, and really the fact that it's coming. It's almost here. Yeah. So um, thank you for that. So one of the, so one of the big things that everyone goes to, so you just mentioned EU probably five or six times and that's great. How does this impact people in the U S though? Um, you know, because I know I've seen, I've mentioned it to a couple of people personally and they just kind of shrugged it like, Oh, that's a, that's a EU thing. It's not a U.S. thing. So can you talk a little bit to that? Definitely. So it is an EU law. And what that means is it's focused on the individuals that are based in the EU. So myself as a US based citizen, unfortunately, I'd like to be an EU citizen. I'd love to live over there. That'd be great. <laughs> um, but as of right now, it's really focused on their data privacy. So as an individual in the EU, the GDPR not only applies to you as a business form, but it applies to you on a personal level. Um, and it's really focused on those citizens. What it means for a US-based business though, is if you market or sell your products in the EU, if you do any sort of marketing or outreach, you're collecting the data of the people in the EU, you still have to think about the GDPR. 
So while it might be a smaller subsect of your contacts database, for example, you know, maybe it's 10%, maybe it's 15%, it's still something you need to pay attention to because just because you're based in the US doesn't mean that you have, you can't look at it because it is for their data privacy. So one of the things that I like to kind of, you know, get people thinking about it, particularly in the US is go into your contacts database, kind of start to filter and see who might be in the EU. Think about the last time you ran like one of your larger campaigns and think about, you know, was anyone there outside of the US? You can start with there and start to kind of whittle it down. In most cases, I have found that while it's some people in the database, it is that lower percentage, somewhere in the five to 10% range, but it's still something to pay attention to. If you want to continue to communicate to them, you need to make sure that you're GDPR compliant with that communication. And I think as a bigger overall, while it is still specific to those EU citizens, I really like to think about the GDPR and HubSpot really likes to think about the GDPR as an opportunity, not so much an obstacle. It's really an opportunity to push all of us to be a little bit more inbound in our communication, the way we process um, that data. So even if you're not looking to be fully compliant because you are a US-based business, you're only focused on U.S. people as of right now. It's still something to kind of, you know, peek your head out, understand what the GDPR is aimed at. And most importantly, you know, you might not think that you do a decent amount of business in the EU right now, um, but it's 2018. Things are changing fast um, and your business is growing. You know, you might be working within an agency like the people that you're working with and they might be growing quickly and all of a sudden they do have people in the EU and you definitely don't want to have to try to, you know, pivot and then get compliant then. It's better to have a baseline understanding of what the GDPR is right now while it's on everyone's attention. There's so much education out there. There's so many different businesses that are talking about it, getting their product compliant. That's one thing we're focused on, making sure that the way our product works is GDPR compliant. And so... You might not be implementing these things right now, but for a US-based business, you definitely need to pay attention to it. Um, from my perspective, I think it's also interesting when we think about the EU and that they're implementing this now, you know, what does that mean for other countries in the coming years? You know, is this something that the US is gonna do probably on a lower scale just by the way that the law works, but you know, what are we gonna implement? Um, so I think getting that baseline understanding now is so important for any business, regardless of where you are. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I know Canada's got a similar law, you know, obviously um, the EU pre previous to the GDPR deadline, like had emphasis around cookies, you know, cookie tracking um, and disclosing that. So, you know, I, I can see with recent things that have happened in the news that it's just going to become more and more top of mind, especially as all these companies are now storing data. In it for different reasons. Um, so when we talk, you mentioned a uh, lawful basis, I think you said earlier. So can you explain a little bit more about that? Um, Cause I want to ma make sure that people understand. Yeah. So lawful basis is one of the really big parts of the GDPR because it is actually how you're going to obtain the consent that you need to communicate. So when we look at lawful basis, really what it means is you need to have a legal reason. You need to have something from the individual that you're collecting data on. So under the GDPR, um, the individual that you're collecting data on is called the data subject. Um, and then there's the controller and the processor. The controller is the business that is actually obtaining that data. The processor is the company that could be processing the data. Um, one really good example that I like to think about is, um, we talk a lot about Anna. So Anna is a contact of yours. She lives in Germany. She's called the data subject and your company you know, HubSpot or whoever, Acme, it, whoever it may be, is called that like the controller of that data. They're actually controlling it. Um, and then, for example, HubSpot, the actual platform would be the processor of Anna's data. So you sort of have three buckets. And what those three buckets really mean for lawful um, basis is that Anna needs to give you some sort of legal reason to collect her data. She needs to know that you're collecting it. She needs to know that you're going to process it. Um, and under this regulation, what it means is that she's either opted in with notice, which means that you've given her notice and you told her what she was opting in to. And this is the big one. This is consent. This is that lawful basis where Anna not only was given notice, 
but she opted into that notice and gave you that lawful basis to process and communicate with her. But that's just one of them. The other one can be, you know, a performance of a contract. So say, for example, you know, from an agency perspective, you know, when you start working with a client, there's a contract involved. And that contract is actually your legal um, basis for communication, for processing, because, you know, you've actually signed a contract. Right. In um, smaller businesses, this could even be a bill. You know, you email her a bill. That's a contract. Um, and then there's legitimate interest. And legitimate interest is one that I think a lot of people are a little bit confused on because what does legitimate interest mean? You know, I have legitimate interest to go get coffee right now, but does that mean that the coffee shop can process my email address? And so the example I like to use is Anna might be a customer of yours and you want to email her direct marketing materials about products you sell related to the one she uses. So Anna here is giving legitimate interest. She's a customer and she wants what you're providing. So I think legitimate interest is the one too, where um, I know we had talked briefly about, you know, what happens to the people that are in our database now, right. you know, the people we've been communicating with and the people that have raised their hand in the past saying, I want to get emails from you. I want to hear about your new products and services. You know, this really is where legitimate interest could come into play. We can talk a little bit about how we're going to obtain all this information in a few minutes, but I think it's really important to understand that under the GDPR, you need to have a reason. And more importantly, you need to document that reason. So one example of this, and um, I do have a screenshot of what this might look like in HubSpot, for example. But what we did was, is we created a contact property to make it really simple. And we've detailed out the types of consent that you can collect so that when you do collect it, it gets logged on the contact property. Cool. You could go to Anna and be like, oh, yep, I have legal basis for consent. She opted in. Performance of a contract. Great. Um, that's really important, too. If, you know, Anna ever says that she wants to have her information deleted, um, you can then go and see what kind of consent you had to begin with. And if it wasn't the right consent, you can take that into consideration moving forward. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you mentioned, you mentioned the, um, you know, the existing lists. So when companies, um, for instance, we have a, um, a contractor here in South Florida and U European um, clients come in all the time uh, to them. So they've got this list of contacts. Um, obviously we can, using HubSpot, we can filter out by IP city or a variety of reasons to figure out um, you know, where people are or even country, but what do we have to do with that list prior to the deadline in order to ensure that we're compliant from that point of view, um, in, in your opinion? Yeah. So one of the most important things here is it will always come down to you and your legal counsel, what you decide to do. Yep. Um, you know, that's an important distinction to make, but for looking at people that are already in your database, one of the biggest questions that has come up over the last few months from the people that I've talked to is like, well, do I have to delete everyone in my database? And I was like, delete? I was like, why? You know, they're like, well, what, what is it that I need to get? What is the consent? How do I process? Um, because these people have been in your database, you know, they could be for a while. Um, right. You're just getting started, maybe not so much, but if you've been around for, for a few years, I mean, it's a decent amount of people's data and also historical information about them that you definitely don't want to lose. So the most important thing here is that you could have these people in your database. You decide, you know, yep, we want to keep them. You and your legal counsel decide that. Great. Moving forward, it's really about documenting the type of consent that you have. So one of the biggest things that we talk about is if you've lost track of the opt-in status. And I would say this is Maybe common, maybe it's not. You know, maybe you haven't used double opt-in in the past. You're now looking at it as GDPR is coming out. You can definitely talk more about double opt-in, but you're not sure the type of status you have for the opt-in mechanism, or you never really confirmed opting in. You can run a permission pass campaign to remove any unconfirmed contacts from future communication. So that permission pass campaign is really going to be something you probably run once maybe ahead of the GDPR, maybe once or twice after, to really request that any contacts who haven't already opted in or confirmed their opt-in, you confirm with them, they'd still like to hear from you, and then you mark that 
if you're using HubSpot, excuse me, you could mark that with the contact property. If you're not, you track that um, opt-in mechanism somewhere else. So this is the biggest way that you can really make sure that the people in your database right now, um, you know, know one, I think that you are thinking about the GDPR. I think that's great. Initially, you know, when you look at a per permission pass campaign, it's, it can be a little nerve wracking. Like, oh, that's so many people that I'm emailing. I don't, I don't want to lose people. Um, but it's a great way to communicate out that you're thinking about the GDPR. You're making sure that you have opt-in status uh, for them. And at the end of the day, the result is going to be a really highly engaged list of contacts because sure. these are people who are raising their hands saying, yes, I want to hear from you. Yes, here's my consent. But then also it's this great way to reconnect and really delight with some of these people. And of course, get the people out of the database and out of your list that might not be engaged with you. Um, right. I know sometimes we can look at numbers as really a key driver of contacts databases, but the way I really like to look at it is it's not so much the number, but the number of engaged people. So this permission to pass campaign can be a great way to really confirm that opt-in status. Perfect. Perfect. So, so just to kind of recap that if like, for instance, a lot of my clients use QuickBooks and it's all people that have had their receipts sent to them, um, you know, or their invoices sent to them. So that, that kind of goes into that you have a contract with them already and you can court, you can coordinate with them. And then of course, if we're doing other marketing, we should probably ask for that. Even if it's coming from a list from QuickBooks, if we can market to them continually, I would assume. Yes. So this is, I think, one of the things that we had sort of, sort of talked about um, even right. briefly was, you know, what are the types of communication that you need to do? You know, sure. is, it, is it that you just need one permission? Is it you need all permission? And the answer here is, of course, in my opinion, but really focusing on being specific as possible. If someone's going to receive information from you on a contract, you know, if, for that example, if it's their bill, it, whatever it might be, but they're also going to receive marketing information from you. You really need to be talking about both. The way we've looked at this inside the HubSpot product is based on subscription type. So when someone is opting in through a GDPR form, um, and I have an example of this, of what it can look like, and really what it is, is multiple checkboxes. And the multiple checkboxes under GDPR will be unchecked, Unlike some other forms you might see where they're pre-checked, they will be Search. unchecked. By um, default. Yep. By default. And it, what it'll show is that it'll be like, you know, do you want me to access and process your information on X? Can I send you emails on X? And it's really gotcha. showing that the contact knows what you're going to do with their data. Um, sure. So that's really where in that example, you'd have two different checkboxes. Um, and it's all based on subscription type. You know, what are they really subscribing to? You know, what are they opting into? And showing them that notice and communication when they fill out a form. In a permission pass campaign, you can do that same thing in the email and communicate that out on the preferences page. Cool, cool, thank you for that. So then another question we've got, is there a limit to consent um, that we'll have for a certain amount of time or days or years um, from the, in the GDPR regulations? Yes, so this part of the law is focused on an individual's right to be forgotten. Um, so they've really write, written this in as the right to be forgotten and it really requires controllers to alert downstream recipients of deletion requests. So that sounds kind of interesting. But what it means is that if Anna, for example, says that she wants her data to be deleted or modified, you as a controller of that data have to alert everyone downstream that that information changes. So, you know, for example, you know, whoever's processing that data also needs to be um, notified that Anna has decided that she wants her stuff deleted. Right. However, um, you know, when we look at days and years, um, there's no specific sort of answer there. It's not necessarily a timestamp. It's not something that's like, yes, on this day after, X amount of years, they need to be deleted. It really takes into account that under the GDPR, you're focusing on data privacy, you're focusing on how really to be more respectful of people's data. So how do you and you know, your legal counsel and your company want to decide how long someone should be in your database? You know, is it that, you know, 
after they haven't engaged with X amount of time, you want to consider deleting them. Um, of course, if they ask to be deleted, that needs to happen very quickly, um, roughly within 30 or 40 days after that request has happened. Under the law, of course, you know, there are some sort of changes, you know, if there's some, some other stuff going on, but it really, if there's a deletion request, it has to happen almost immediately. Um, but when we look at right to be forgotten, the way I like to think about it is think about yourself and the amount of portals or accounts or databases sure. that you probably live in and ones that you probably don't interact with. How would we feel about them keeping that data continuously forever? And then really what would we rather have them do? And, you know, think about it that way and then try to decide, you know, what that means for you and your business. The most important part to think about is you need to make sure you have a process in place. So what happens and who's in control of when Anna requests for her information to be deleted versus also what happens when you want to implement right to be forgotten, you know, is who does she need to reach out to, you know, how is that communicated? Um, really focusing on some of those things because, you know, they need to know that their data can be removed. Um, and they definitely know that the GDPR is very clear about that. So if she wants to be removed. She's going to be reaching out. Yeah. So that, that brings up a couple of curious points. Um, so one, one of the follow-ups that I got um, actually this morning, that's why it wasn't in my notes for earlier was, so what happens if that, if Anna wants to be deleted and I, as a salesperson have a CRM note about recent talks we've had or something, does that data, should that data also be deleted as well? Yeah. So everything is removed. Um, anything gotcha. that would be identifiable about Anna. So in those notes, it could be, you know, Anna's talking about changing her business in X, Y, and Z. That's personal data about Anna and her business. Um, wow. So in HubSpot, we actually have a GDPR deletion function now. Um, so okay. it's going to show all the information that's removed. Um, and what happens is, is let's say Anna comes back. Because this has been also a big question. Or it's right. like, well, what if she tries to come back? You know, she, she wanted her information deleted, but six months from now, she's changed businesses or she's changed organizations, you know, whatever. And she's like, oh, wait, I want to come back into this business. Uh, right. You know, how do we process that? What's going to happen is there's going to be actually a function that appears that shows you that Anna had been previously deleted and sort of okay. some steps on the type of communication that you can do to make sure that she actually wants to be coming back to your business. Sure. Um, the historical data that is saved on her is, um, is actually made sort of invisible. So while the metrics that you have, so if Anna visited your website and you're yep. tracking the number of visits, the number of visits isn't going to change. It's not that Anna's information is deleted. You're just not going to see her name associated. Gotcha. With it's not associated with the data. Got it. Yeah. So, so if, um, if she does come back, that data is no longer there unless she says that she wants it back or that data is no longer there. Um, even if she says she wants to come back. Yeah. There, there's kind of two specific ones. There's sort of like a soft delete, um, uh -huh. which is a little bit different than like a hard delete. A sure. hard GDPR delete is, you know, really it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. And honestly, you know, in my personal opinion, if Anna's saying a hard delete of her, of her information, the chances of her coming back are probably not great. Yeah, I would I say if you're, you're taking that kind of action with a business, maybe it's not just a right fit. Um, yep. But I sort of have that breakdown of what that actually looks like. Um, there's a nice little red pop up, GDPR deletion, um, and some information about you know what that really means for for Anna's data. Um, but the nice thing is, is you know it's not like you're going to lose your your website visits or the the information that you actually are doing on tracking. Um, okay. That's not going to go away but Anna will no longer be able to be identifiable to you and your business. Cool. Yeah. Cause I know like closest thing for us would be unsubscribes. So we've had people who unsubscribe and then six months later they'll come back and they'll like confirm and resubscribe. And it's like, why'd you unsubscribe in the first place? So it's, so I can only imagine, you know, that even, even deeper from a, from the GDPR point of view where, Oh, go ahead and delete my stuff. And then remember we talked six months ago. Well, no, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> I'm sorry we don't. Um, you know, that's, that's one of those things I think companies will, pre will start to fear is, wait a minute, did I actually have a conversation with this person or not? Um, I think, it, and it's one of those things is more of a mindset shift than I think an actual issue. It opinion. is. And I, I think that's, you know, an important piece to bring up is that one of the biggest things with GDPR for any business, but I think even more, um, probably more focused even on an agency perspective is that, you know, it's really the way that you are thinking about how you're collecting data and how you're teaching others to collect data. You know, I talk a ton about the contacts database and, you know, if I could have a sticker that I wear every day that say like, I heart contacts, like I would, um, because it's the core of your business. It's the core of doing, you know, good and bad marketing is making sure that the user, the contact in your database feels valued and that they know that they have trust with you. And the GDPR is really forcing you to build that trust in a human and helpful way. You know, you need to make sure that when someone comes to your business, they immediately feel like they're sort of joining like a cool secret club. Like they're like in on it and right. they're going to have a good relationship with you and your business. And that's really a mind shift, you know, to your point than anything. While the law is going to give you the guidelines and it's going to give you the things you have to do, um, shifting that mindset within your business is really what you have control over. Um, you know, how are we going to talk about this? Um, one of, I think the important things to note is, you know, you're growing agency, you're growing business, you're going to bring in on new, you know, employees. How do you make sure you educate them on the way that you think about GDPR um, and the way that you are actually doing the GDPR within your business? Yeah. So policies, right? Um, that's one of those things. So I know I would assume that everyone's got to update their privacy policies to, to talk about this stuff. I know most of the time when we talk to companies, we're like, do you have a privacy policy? They're like, go find one. So I'm sure that this is uh, a further emphasis on making sure that we're being intentional about the data collection, but then also the disclosure of how we're using that data. So, um, so when we talk about looking up for looking up an attorney to help with that kind of thing, what do you have any insight into the types of attorneys that someone should look for in the U S cause I know from a GDPR point of view, it's been really hard for me to find anyone to talk to, but like who, what's the type of business or attorney that you think that they should be um, looking up for that kind of info? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where it is going to come down to whatever you decide to do and who you decide to reach out to. But right. keeping in mind that the GDPR is almost here um, right. and that it is gaining a lot more momentum right now. Um, I'd say six months ago, it was a little bit harder maybe to talk to legal counsel in your area because they were like, what's the GDPR? <laughs> um, we, we've definitely, there's a lot more communication happening about it right now. Um, yeah. And so I don't think it's, you know, one specific type, you know, also particularly on the area that you might live in. Um, where they might be doing more communication with the EU. It's just going to be finding someone who has services that at least knows what the GDPR is and sure. really like trying to find someone in that, in that space. Um, I think too now is there's so much more communication about it, even just from bigger businesses, that it's going to be a lot more flow of information to legal counsels in different areas. Um, as for specific types, I don't necessarily have a recommended set, um, sure. but I would just keep in mind that if you know what you need, um, particularly like, oh, I'm going to update my privacy policy, or I'm going to be looking at, you know, my terms of service or these kind of things, coming with those specific action items can be helpful to kind of understand what they need to know and what you need to know. Um, you know, if you have in-house counsel, that's great. And hopefully, sure. you know, you're able to educate with them on what the GDPR is. And if you're looking outwards, um, just try to be as honest as possible is that it's, you know, GDPR focused and more and more people are going to be educated on it and continue to be educated on it. Cause that's one of, I think the great things about the GDPR and I say great, I don't know if anyone else would agree with me, but it doesn't end on Friday. You know, Fridays are, you know, May 25th, we're, we're getting everyone compliant. But after that, it's really how you set these processes up moving forward, you know, getting this to be a solidified process for you and your business and how that's going to apply for years to come. Sure. Well, that's, that's a great point. So, so let's f forget about platform now. Um, now I'm going to put you on the spot with some agency specific questions. So a um, couple scenarios, we get clients that hand us a list. Um, 
whether they actually hand us a disc or whether they send it via email. Um, there's a lot of different things that could be um, cause issue with that from a GDPR point of view. What, so what are some dangers that we have to look at as an agency, in your opinion, regarding that passing of information? Yeah, the, the biggest thing is coming up with, you know, a set of questions and or like a guidelines for you as an agency and other agencies of what you need to get also in addition to the list. So, sure. you know, one of the biggest questions is where did this list come from? And, you know, depending on what that answer is, it's sort of like, well, then how do you actually confirm the consent? If we're looking at it from a GDPR perspective, it is going to be making sure they've recorded the lawful basis for communication or process. So, okay. you know, if that list comes with that property and it's, you know, lawful basis for consent, boom, 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 they're able to show you the form where they collected that information. Here's the list. Got it. You're, you're checking the boxes. But I think really from an agency perspective, it's recording that somewhere. Getting yourself some sort of guidelines of what do you need from a GDPR perspective when someone hands you a list. Sure, um, sure. Handing off a list is also kind of in the, in the world and realm where we don't want to live. Um, right. you know, we really want to be focusing on these people came. I know they came to you know, X, Y, and Z, and they've hand raised, they've consented, they're in. Um, but really it's focusing on, you know, where did it come from? And if it came from somewhere, where did we actually record the lawful, um, basis to process or communicate? Perfect. Perfect. So I didn't even think about that as an actual field that should be in that list, um, from an agency point of view that we look for it. But then the other side would be to have some kind of form. I know we're going to work on a disclosure where they actually sign off saying that they have the rights to that list so that it kind of passes the, um, uh, passes the buck back to the customer, uh, because technically by taking that list as an agency, we're now a processor as well of that data, right? If you are uploading it anywhere, I mean, you know, yeah. I'm assuming that you don't just sit and look at the list, um, right. and you know, like, oh, this is a really nice list of names. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have to upload it somewhere. Most of the time HubSpot. <laughs> you know, you're uploading it. And so you are now, you know, the processor of that information. Um, you know, whoever's database you're also uploading it into is also the processor of the information because it's actually the database that's processing it. But, yep. you know, you're taking ownership of that information because you're also doing outreach. You know, if you're clicking send, if you're communicating with those people. Um, and so keeping in mind that, you know, when talking with a customer, I think the most important question to ask first is how many people on this list are EU citizens and do you sure. know? And if they don't know, it's sort of being like, okay, why don't you go back, kind of take a look and really see, you know, do we need to be looking at GDPR here? You know, is every single person in here from Florida, if they are, okay, well, that's a different story. But, you know, right. really pushing everyone to really think about, you know, not only do we need to have, you know, kind of a communication here between the agency and the customer about GDPR whenever that happens, yeah. but also like, you know, where did you get these people? And what do you really know about them? Um, I think can be a little bit of an awkward conversation, particularly to get started because people are like, well, you've never asked about this before. Why does it matter now? Um, and you know, Hold a big GDPR sign. That's, that's going to be what we're going to do now. <laughs> exactly. And I think really also positioning that conversation as an opportunity, you know, really from an agency perspective, be like, Hey, like I'm trying to help you and your business grow. The way that we're going to grow is that we're only talking to people that we're engaging with and that are excited about working with our business. And, you know, let's, let's watch the numbers rise as we really implement some of these more best practices of inbound marketing is really what it comes down to. Um, you know, cool. a lot of the stuff outlined in GPR is what we want to be doing anyways. Um, you know, we want to be not interruptive. We don't want to be spammy. We really want to be building that value and that trust. Um, and I think when positioning the conversations that way, it puts it on a lot of a different note versus like, you need to tell me where these people came from. Um, yeah. feels a little bit like a parent punishing their kid. Like, where did you go tonight? Um, <laughs> and so really framing as an opportunity for growth, not so much an obstacle to get over. 
Yeah, 100%. Well, thank you so much, Courtney, for your time today. Why don't you share a little bit about how people can get in touch with you and, you know, other areas of information that you have. And of course, we'll have all this information available in the show notes. Yeah, one of the biggest things is there is a lesson in the HubSpot Learning Center, free education for anyone um, about the GDPR. And it's all about creating a GDPR strategy. So we talked about some things high level here, but it really yep. deep dives into the law. So, you know, okay. what are the different areas of the law? You know, how does that get translated into English, basically? Um, yep. You know, really taking that legal term and um, getting it to an understanding. So if you're getting started with the GDPR, you're getting your customers started with the GDPR, it's a great place to start to understand the baseline. Um, so that's one thing. If you're looking from a HubSpot side, you know, we do have um, changes to the product that have are been out and are also coming. Um, so I do have a page um, listed about those changes and how they can help you. Um, if you want to reach out to me, my name is Courtney Sembler. I am an inbound professor on the Academy team. So you're happy to tweet at me from HubSpot Academy um, at me at C Sembler. Um, I'm around. I love to chat. Um, and if you have GDPR questions, just let me know. Um, I know it's something that changes the way all of us really do business. So questions are encouraged. Yeah. There are no, you know, weird or dumb questions out there when it comes to GDPR because it affects all of us. So let me know. Um, you can chat with me and just look me up, Courtney Stumbler. Um, there's not many of me out there. So to be <laughs> fine. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and have a great day. You as well.